They forced us to keep making games with similar designs. The same old ideas. If we could try something new for once, maybe we wouldn't get such low ratings. This is a game I've been very curious about ever since it was announced. Super Neptunia RPG. Not only does it feature 2D artwork and gameplay, but it's also the first Neptunia game made by a non-Japanese studio. Not to mention it's the first game in the series to be also released on a Nintendo console. I have heard things about Super Neptunia, namely the fact that it bombed in Japan, and also there was this gameplay footage I saw that included some ridiculous jumping animations, and that kind of concerned me. Thankfully, none of that has had any influence on my enjoyment of the game. I love it. This is one of my favorite Neptunia games that has ever come out. The graphics look good, even if there are wonky animations. Not like the 3D games don't have that. The music is excellent. The story is the best since the original Hyperdimension Neptunia on the PS3. The satire and parody levels as well as humor are back up to OG NEP spec as well. I like the battle mechanics where you can change the formation on the fly and there is a more complex elemental system. That's just off of the top of my head. There's so many things I like about Super Neptunia RPG. Obviously there are some things I'm not too keen on but we'll get to all of that later. The game is available on PC, PS4 and Switch. Basically all of the footage you see here is of the PC version. A dedicated graphical comparison video will come out in the future that'll tackle the subject in depth. First, some background info for people who might not be so familiar with the Neptunia series. Hyperdimension Neptunia is a series where game consoles are represented as girls, who are goddesses, that reside in and rule over their own nations. Neptune is based on the never-released Sega Neptune, Noir is based on the PS3, Lawn is based on the Nintendo Wii, and Vert is based on the Xbox 360. The goddesses have two forms, Normal and HDD. In HDD mode, their appearance and personality changes, and they get a stat boost. Their names also change to Purple Heart, Black Heart, White Heart, and Green Heart. The world is called Game Industry, and the plot points in the games are based on various real-life happenings, and also historical video game pop culture. There are also other characters who represent companies. The ones that almost always show up in every game are Compa and IF, based on Compile Heart and Idea Factory. Over the years, the association between the goddesses and their consoles has decreased somewhat. So in a way, they represent the brands more than actual consoles, which makes sense. This can't be a series that's permanently only about 7th gen consoles. I think that should bring most newcomers up to speed. Let's get into the story of Super Neptunia RPG. After witnessing what is seemingly a dream sequence of Neptune and the other goddesses trying to defeat a shadowy version of Neptune, we see Neptune wake up. In true Neptunia fashion, Neptune doesn't seem to remember who she is. Conveniently, she does remember her name and the fact that she's the main protagonist. She sets out on an adventure to recover her memories where she stumbles upon Chrome, a mysterious character who seems to know a lot of information but won't divulge exactly what she knows and what her motivations are. Now, I'm not sure what Chrome is actually based on, but it sure sounds par for the course for a Google product. After a short while, she stumbles upon Noir, Blonde, and Vert, who also seem to suffer of Neptunia disease. I mean, amnesia. Meanwhile, an oppressive regime called Bombex Mori is trying to revert game industry back to a time where only 2D games existed. Nep and Co. set out to defeat them and gain back their memory at the same time. I really like this game. Yes, there's amnesia again, but hey, that's this franchise's gimmick. Again with the amnesia, huh? What? No, I do not think it's cliché. For me, the story has a very similar vibe to the very first Hyperdimension Neptunia. They did a good job of world building. Since the world doesn't look like it does in other games, it's like you're seeing everything for the first time with the characters. The humor is more satirical and less meme-like, and the whole world just feels more grand in scope compared to some of the later games. Later games? I mean, um, previous games. There we go. Proofread your script, everyone. Let's talk about what it's like to play the game. NEP games are usually turn-based, and they still kind of are. But there's some real-time elements too. When you're running around the world, you'll see doggoos running around as well. Those are the enemies. They all look like that, even if uh, your enemies aren't doggoos at all. Battle starts if you come in contact with them. Formation and AP is the name of the game. 
Your party members stand in a sort of square or diamond formation. Each character is assigned a controller face button. Pressing one of the buttons makes the corresponding character perform an attack. An action results in your AP rising. You need AP to attack or perform skills. Same thing applies to the baddies. The gauge on the bottom left shows you how much AP they've got. If you attack enemies in the overworld, you get an AP advantage, so keep that in mind. It's a useful thing. Formations are very important. Depending on what I did during editing, you might have seen the characters rotate around. That's when you change formation with the L1 and R1, or left and right bumpers, or L and R depending which language you speak. In the menu, you can change what sort of skills and attacks are activated in each formation. There's four formations overall. Each one has their own advantage. Heal, for example, heals each party member by a small amount each time you gain AP. That's always a good one to fall back on. Each character can have a different skill for each formation. I really like that because that allows you to switch tactics on the fly depending on what's going on and what sort of enemies pop up. The game isn't super difficult, but you can die pretty easily the first time you are in Louis and you don't have any non-physical attacks set up to use against Pudding Kind. Item usage is very much up to you. You can go ham if you want. I like it because it's really easy to heal and it doesn't use up AP like a healing skill would. You've got the usual status ailments which can be dealt with using skills or items, but you can also attack using items. There's different crystals dealing elemental and physical damage. Since usage isn't restricted, you can almost literally pelt your opponents with rocks until they die. This is like the opposite of the item system in the original Neptunia, where you just set a percentage and hope for the best. You can stack skills and attacks, but I'd be careful doing that. It is possible to waste attacks on an enemy that's just dying. So I recommend spacing the attacks apart slightly to make sure that if an enemy does fall, the next attack gets properly directed to another enemy. Obviously, if there's just one enemy, then go nuts. It feels kind of like traditional turn-based combat. In a way it is, because only one party can do something before the other one does something, but it's more free-flowing. You can use up more AP and do, you know, one move after the other, or you can store it up and let the enemies use up theirs, and then you attack, you know, just with a big combo. You can feel things out with the different formations, and you can play around with your playing style. So that's a pretty cool thing about this whole battle system. Eventually, the goddesses are able to transform into HDD mode. In order to do that, you have to get this meter up by getting hit by enemies. A bit annoying, but at least the meter doesn't reset every battle, so you can save it up for a bigger boss. In turn, attacking the enemy brings up the break gauge. Once a quarter of it is full, a character can use a break attack. It's like a special attack, complete with fancy animations. Actually, it looks a little bit like in Disgaea, but not quite as over the top. Unlike other games, Super Neptunia RPG doesn't have any overworld and a list of dungeons to go into. You just head out of town and the places between locations serve as a dungeon. Sometimes the locations are also dungeons. I like that because it creates distance between the nations. I really don't like how you basically select dungeons from a list like in most Neptunia games. You move left and right to go from one section to the next, Often there are multiple paths, like high and low, so it's not really a linear experience. You can go back and forth, and it's slightly maze-like. Other times there's also a path that branches off and you can click on them uh, to follow them. There's platforming elements. The jumping looks crazy, but it feels fine to control. When playing it, you think more about gameplay functions, not how funky the animations look. Eventually, you get Pudingo, which you can jump on to increase jump height. Later still, you get the ability to double jump, which allows you to get to even more spaces. Combine that with dashing, which you learn at the very beginning, and it'll allow you to quickly get from one place to another. Avoiding battles is quite easy too, so that's helpful. You have to be careful though, because the terrain sometimes covers up enemies and it's easy to accidentally run into or jump onto them. There are guild quests, which is usually a kill this specific monster at this specific location sort of quest. You can accept quests from NPCs too. Some quests aren't doable right away. For example, a quest I got right at the beginning of the game in Last Station was only doable after several hours of gameplay because I had to learn double jump first. It's best to just accept everything. 
because a lot of times you just happen to gather what you need along the way or talk to the correct people because the storyline brings you to the correct nation. Plus, your reward is money and experience, so there's no reason not to do that. Each city has its shops where you can buy weapons, equipment, and items. I like that you have to travel from one place to another to get certain items. Being forced to travel makes the world feel more vast. It's not really a hassle to move around, though you probably have to consult the map a little bit here and there. The way everything is structured reminds me of Muramasa from the Wii and Vita. It's 2D and the world is laid out in a similar way where you have to travel from one place to another. Being compared to any Vanillaware game is high praise, by the way. It's time to talk about graphics. The best thing about SuperNEP is that there's no graphical element that is recycled. It's all bespoke for this game. I like the art style. All the different nations have their own look. It's great how recognizable they still are, even though the setting has changed from a modern look to a more fantastical style. It fits the story appropriately, too. The character sprites all have a great look. Weapons are quite detailed and you really notice them when you switch them out for others. The walking animations can be a bit strange. The crazy jumping, like I said, is the first thing I noticed. It's quite jarring at first, but I got used to it. The idle animations of the four main characters are true to the other Neptunia games. They transition well into the 2D space, and it's nice that they're actually recognizable. I was going to give Noir the award for the best idle animation at first, but then I saw Kampa. Never have I seen so much movement for something that is literally just a standing animation. I like it and it cracks me up. The animations are overall good though and they help liven up the cutscenes with expressive movements. The cutscenes just look so good. Yes, you'll notice the same animations being used here and there again. But that's better than having the same animations being used across multiple games. I'm going to make a comparison video between the different versions of this game. As of this moment, I'm still waiting on the Switch version, but I already have experience with the PS4 and PC versions. Even the PS4 and PC versions feel different. The PC is the smoothest and runs at 60 FPS, no problem on my computer. The PC version sometimes does stutter in transitioning between animations and fights. It's usually just the first couple of fighting animations after launching the game. Afterwards, it's much smoother. The PS4 game looks the same basically, but it doesn't run at 60 FPS all the time on a base model PS4. Usually when you're running around, it's uh, it looks like it's above 30, but definitely under 60. Though in battles, it's usually closer to 60. And those little hiccup moments happen more frequently, or at least I notice them more. Once the Switch version comes in, I'm going to do a video so you can see for yourself. For now, anyone with the Switch version, let everyone know in the comments how your experience has been compared to the PC footage you see here. Hopefully that'll help some people out for now. There's also this whole censorship thing. Some people follow it, others don't. If you want to know, the PS4 game has two CG images that are changed. An image of Vert is zoomed in so you don't see her undies. Another is a hot spring bath scene that has more steam. So if you want to purposely buy the version that doesn't have these changes, get the PC or Switch game. Interestingly enough, this CG remained intact in the PS4 game. So yeah, nice consistency there, Sony. Let's get to the sound. I really like the music. Each region has its own theme to emphasize the visuals. It's a fantasy-oriented soundtrack with lots of classical instruments, unlike the electronic music we usually hear. The songs for the most part have a humble feel to them. It's not grandiose and over the top, usually, as some fantasy games like to get. Skyrim is one of the greatest offenders. You know how the theme song starts out with these bassy drumming sounds from the distance? and it builds up into something that sounds generically epic. There's chanting and then every single instrument in the world somehow needs to join in for some reason. I don't like that. It's the ultimate in cheese. The Morrowind theme song is the same melody, but it's much more atmospheric, gentle and subtle. It builds up to its most exciting moment in a more clever way. But there's also space between the sounds. On the YSN RPG music scale of cheese, Super Neptunia RPG is on the Jarlsberg Morrowind end rather than the processed cheese powder Skyrim theme song end. I have no problems with the sounds, the effects all seem appropriate. You can choose between English and Japanese voice actors. 
Neptunia is one of those I play in English for the most part. For the graphics comparison video, I played the PS4 game in Japanese. One thing that's apparent early on is that not everything is dubbed in English, which is not surprising at all, given the track record, but it's still disappointing. There's one part where Blonde gets really excited about a comic cat like event. In English, it's completely unvoiced, which is a shame. It's funny still, but it would have been much better if we heard more than just silence. There's numerous other cutscenes where characters make sarcastic remarks, which would have been much funnier if voiced. I want to hear the sass. So overall, I like Super Neptunia RPG a lot. One of the most fun parts of the game is that the 2D gameplay ties in with the story. There are a lot of moments where the writers are self-aware. There's something good to be said about people who don't take themselves too seriously and can make a joke at their own expense, without a self-inflated sense of worth getting in the way. One question I've been asking myself while playing is, what would a newbie to the series think of Super Neptunia RPG? It's difficult for myself to try and imagine what I would think of the game if I never played Neptunia games before. On one hand, there's a bunch of details and character quirks that not everybody picks up on right away, like how Histoire speaks in emoticons only at first, Vert's obsessive gaming habits, and Blonde's equally enthusiastic book obsession. Those are probably alright, since it's just a thing you learn about the characters, but the whole noir is desperate for friends thing might not be so obvious. An early game cutscene where Blonde and Neptune are trying to convince Noir to join them in their quest might seem a bit strange to those who are inexperienced in Nepology. Your friend. Friend. Similarly, seeing Planetune for the first time will probably mean more to someone who knows what Planetune is actually supposed to look like. What Neptunia RPG does well, however, is introduce themes as the story progresses. Not only does it keep the player interested, because advancing the story rewards you with more dots to connect, but NEP newcomers learn about the series as the game progresses. Other games just projectile vomit a synopsis at you at the beginning, but I think it's more fun learning all this stuff over time. The vomit approach, in my opinion, is a bit lazy. It's like saying, here's some info. Now that you're done absorbing the information, we're going to pretend that you know everything about the series. Gradually explaining the world, and yes, I'm going to use the word lore, is more difficult to do, and it shows a greater amount of care from the developers. So yes, I do think you can start with Super Neptunia RPG and have a good time. Just don't expect the other games to play or look like this one. I had a great time with this game. This is the most fun I've had with a Neptunia game in many years. It combines a lot of what I like of the first game's story, throws in good-looking 2D graphics, and gameplay that isn't frustrating, but still makes sure you're paying attention. Since you can't button mash after all, you gotta set up your skills and use formations. So that's the game. I hope the review was helpful or at least entertaining to some regard. Thank you to all the Patreon supporters. You can be a supporter too. Check out the Patreon page for more details. Also, there's a Discord server. I've neglected it for a while now, but it would be great to see some new faces there. Invite link is in the description, and so is all the other stuff for that matter like Twitter and the second channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again in the next video.